I want to start going before they do because they are just too good. That choir did such a good job this morning. What a, what a blessing it is to be able to uh, to be able to worship God uh, in, a, in the house of the Lord. Uh, today, <clears throat> I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalms chapter 37. And we want to talk about being the man that God has called me to be. <clears throat> Psalms 37 verse 4. It says, Delight thyself also in the Lord. We stand for the reason of God's word. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. You may be seated. Go to the short one. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. As a young man, as a young man, I misunderstood what this verse meant. I thought that it meant that God gave me what I wanted. It said, delight yourself in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. But think about it more this way. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He shall teach you what to desire. He'll teach you what to desire. Um, to delight thyself is to find your purpose. Each person in here has a purpose to feel in the church. That there are no bench warmers. There is no a room for just sitters. That's not what the church is about. This is the, the, the living body of God. That's what we are, the, the, the bride of Christ. And we're to act that way and to be that way. To delight ourselves, to find our purpose, and to find our joy. It just seems like I see so many people that are depressed, that feel bad. How do we get that joy? It's by finding our purpose, by delighting ourselves in those things that delights God. Uh, to find your dream, to find your dream, a God will not sell for scraps. Are you listening to We can't give God scraps and expect for Him to bless us when we won't do anything but give what's left over or what we didn't need to begin with. And I'm not talking about just money. I'm talking about our time and our life and the way that we uh, uh, conduct ourselves as a reflection of Jesus. When you think about it like that, that we're supposed to be a reflection of Jesus, what are we delighting ourselves? Uh, think about David. David was going to turn out to be one of the um, <clears throat> leading figures in the Old Testament. And uh, he was a shepherd sitting out on a hill. Do you think he was sitting on that hill counting the sheep saying, this is what I want for my life? He was probably thinking, I hope I can get a hundred sheep so I can have more than my dad so I can make some money. When God had so much more planned for him than just to be a shepherd. He had a plan for David, but David had to follow God. If he didn't, he would still be sitting on that hill counting his sheep. But God gave him a purpose. And then he enabled him to do it. One thing, God will never get you to do something that he can't finish. Now, it may be something that you can't finish. But it's not something that he can't finish. No. So the desires of our heart is more than just wishes. And I, I, I lived like this for a long time where I just wish things were different. A desire and a wish is different. Uh, I wish I had a bath boat. My wife wishes we had a house. <laughs> uh, but that's just wishing. When we have a desire, it means that we put feet behind it, that we, we do things to accomplish it. And there must be some things we're trying to accomplish as Christians. That's what brings our delight. That's what gives our joy. We'll never have more joy than we're giving ourselves away. One of the big problems in America today is that men no longer raise their children. Right. That, that men have stepped away from their role as a father and have become more providers than teachers. Uh, there's a, a, a big part of our uh, population that is raised by just their mothers or just their grandmothers. Dads, we've got to find our delight in serving God with our family. We don't serve with, in spite of our family. We serve with our family. Uh, when I was a young youth pastor, my son was, was in the group. And when he graduated and left, I had no idea how much stuff he did. He did all kinds of stuff. He, 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 he uh, turned the lights on, the air conditioners, all that kind of stuff. He got stuff ready for church. He was prepared, but it had to be a purpose. And once he was gone, there had to be somebody to fill it. 
can be somebody that's in it. I want you to think, what is your role in the church today? What do you do? How do you contribute? And how do you try to impact the world for Jesus? Because there has to be a desire to do it. Not just wishing that the church will be full. We may have to go out and ask people. Not just wishing that we had this or wishing we had that, but we have to do things in order to put ourselves in that position. Uh, I, I believe God honors hard work. Amen. I really do. I believe He honors hard work. Now, I'm going to give you today four examples of some dads that serve their family and serve God and make great differences. Uh, I got this computer because I couldn't see my Bible no more. And now I can't see it, so I don't know what I'm going to have to do next. I have to get me a screen or something. But turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a man, uh, was just a man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, even when everything was falling apart around Noah, right? He was building this boat that had never rained before. People were saying he was crazy. Uh, he was uh, out of his mind. Why are you doing this? And it was a lot of work. It was, it was hard work to do that. But God chose Noah because he would use his family to serve him. Even when everything was falling apart, Noah found favor with God. He was righteous and blameless in his generation. That meant that he had a good reputation, that people knew who Noah was. Now, even though they thought he was crazy, they knew where he stood. He was never ashamed of that. Noah was different. And sometimes it's hard to be different whenever we're talking about our kids, right? We want our kids to be happy at school. We want them to be well adjusted. We, want them to, we don't ever want to see bad things happen. We never want to see them sad, but that's just not life. That's just not life. There's going to be struggles in this life. There, there will be. Uh, Brother Charlie was talking about that uh, uh, just a few minutes ago. And we see that uh, it's just not possible to go through life and not get some bruises. But when we stick together and our family is there with us and we learn how to overcome and not be swallowed up by our circumstance because we believe that God can do the impossible. Amen. And if we really believe that, what would be different in our life? If we, if we live like we believe that Jesus was fixing to give that midnight cry Amen. and he was coming home, who, who would you want to go speak to first? Who, who would you want to go tell, look, Jesus is coming, you need to be ready. Amen. Well, then that's what we need to be doing because we say it's going to come like a thief in the night. We don't know the day or the hour. Jesus is waiting on the command of the Father to send him back, and then it is over. It will be done. The, the church's work will be finished. And then the reward. But think about those that are not going to go. How many of us have got a brother or a sister, a child, a cousin, a friend, a co-worker that we know they don't know Jesus? Have we been on our knees praying that they would come to know Him? Have we been doing things to encourage them about Jesus, showing them the kindness and the love of God? If we're not, then we're being a secret agent. You, know, you ever seen those secret agents? They'll keep their badge on the inside, but they, they just look like everybody else, right? To be a Christian, we can't just blend in. You can't just blend in. We can't think that our kids won't have any struggles at school because if they really are serving God, they will get ridiculed for it. If they're really serving God, they're going to pay a price. But look, that price is nothing compared to the reward that we have. We need to be raising soldiers and not whiners. Was that too much? Noah was different 
and we can be different. But we have to be different in a way that we are respecting what God would have us to do in the purpose that He has set out for us. Find your purpose. Seek it. The next man I'll tell you about is Abraham. Uh, in Genesis 18, 19, it says, For I know him, this is God talking, For I know him that he will command to his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord uh, may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. God chose to set a nation apart to begin the process of redeeming the world. And he looked at Abraham and said, Abraham, I know you, and I pick you because I know you'll teach your kids what I'm teaching you. That's what God has desired for us to do, uh, just to, to, to be mentors and teachers of, to our kids. When Noah was little, we had a bat cage in our yard. And I bet, I couldn't tell you the hundreds of hours that we threw a baseball. And now he's a preacher and our baseball player. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. But we probably could have been doing some better stuff with their time than always throwing a baseball. But as I was leading my son, we used that kind of time to talk about Jesus, talk about how to be a man. Some of the best conversations me and my son ever had, we were chasing a coon uh, behind two or three dogs. And still investing in our kids. Investing in our kids. So God chose us to, to set a nation apart, to raise up the nation. He chose a man that he knew would lead his children. Following God is less mystical and more practical. Sometimes we want a feeling or we want a, uh, what you know, my daughter told me when we sung that song, she said, my hair stood up. Got chill bones. That's a, I, I love that kind of singing too. But that ain't, that, that ain't all it is. There's more to it. So, we must hold the Word of God in high esteem. If the leaders of our family don't hold the Word in high esteem, you, the, your followers won't either. That's right. That's right. Are you listening to me, dads? If you don't hold the Word of God in high esteem, that means learning from it, reading it, teaching it to your kids. Uh, the, the, just like Charlie said about big, bring them to church. That's a big deal. Just to have a dad that says, get up, we're going to church. It was never a question, because I was a pastor, but it was never a question when we go to church on Sunday morning. My kids got up and they got dressed because they knew we were going to do it. Because we were consistent. Consistent. God wants consistent men in a godly way to mentor and raise up their kids. Amen. So, the third one I'll tell you about is Job. In Job 1.5, <clears throat> it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and up upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of ox, five hundred uh, donkeys, a very great household. So this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for the three sisters to eat and drink with him. Now, Job received attention because he prayed for his kids. It was, he prayed for his how, how many times have we prayed for our children? Now, how many times have we talked to them to see what we need to be praying with them about? About their spiritual life. If we don't mock it, they won't do it. Very seldom, very seldom, have I seen kids that would outgrow their parents. That's pretty scary, isn't it? Seldom do I see kids that will outgrow their parents. They'll usually go to whatever level of um, <coughs> commitment that you did, that's what your kids are going to do or less. That's, right. that's what they're going to do or less. So it's important that we are constantly teaching and loving and bringing them to church and then letting them be a part of the ministry with us. Kids don't need just to come up and do pizza parties. They need to be learning the Word of God, and then they need to be serving. They need to be in the community serving the, the elderly or, or the underprivileged or the homeless. There's so much we can do. We just got to do it. So much we can do. A lot of times people tell me, I don't really know what to do. I don't to start something. Most times don't have to start something. Help or something's already going on, but God will take care of all those ideas and all those things that you want to do, he'll give them to you. God wants us to serve Him and He wants us to listen 
to what he's telling us to do. Not just, a, I went on a mission trip one time, and I think we painted a church that had been painted about 30 times that summer. Useless. It, we did nothing. It was useless. So not just spinning our wheels and doing things to say that we did something, but to find the voice that God has in us and then to make it come through with the church. Amen. That's what God has called us to do. So Job prayed for his, his family. Not because they were bad, but he knew that they were humans. Now, your children, you may not know this, but your kids will not be perfect. I know I pulled that one out of nowhere, didn't I? That was, <laughs> they are not perfect and they will fail. It's not our job to, um, to humiliate them. It's just our job to help them. To bring them up, to teach them. Now, that means we don't have discipline, no. But it means that being mad is not what's going to fix it. It's being godly is the thing that's going to fix it. To have forgiveness and to say, let's move on. Let's do something different. The worst thing we can do is act like nothing's happening. Sometimes it's easier to do that. To act like we don't see what's happening. But your kids are they're in need of their dad's uh, teaching. Right? That's why we have age limits on stuff. We don't let kids vote until they get 18 or uh, join the army until they get 18. It's because they still need to be taught. They still need help with their decisions. It's good to let children have independence, but not so much that they can hang themselves. Children should hear their dads pray. I know you've heard me say that before. They should know what their daddy sounds like praying. Amen. That's where they're going to learn how to do it. And I'm not talking about the prayer that we say, that mumble the little prayer right before you go to sleep. I'm talking about some people that are praying for real things. And then uh, I would always write some down, the things I was praying about. And that way, whenever God answered that prayer, I'd be able to look at it and say, God does answer prayers. And then sometimes when I was feeling bad or sometimes when maybe I was uh, just having some trouble, I could go back and look and say, I know I don't feel close to God now, but I know He's there. Because I've seen Him work in my life. I've seen Him do these things in my life. The last one that I'll tell you about, the last dad, is Joshua. Now Joshua chose the Lord for his family. Amen? He chose the Lord for his family. In Joshua 24, 14, it says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether gods of your father serve that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He said, make a choice. If you're not going to serve God, then go serve whatever you want to. But don't say you're going to do it and not do it. Right? But it's for me and my family, no matter what anybody else does, we're going to serve the Lord. That's, we talked about taking a stand. That's the kind of stand that we got to take. That me and my family are going to serve God no matter what's happening in the world. Because the world is crazy right now. And I don't think Jesus is going to tarry much longer. But that's not my decision. All I can do is what the Bible tells us to is that we got to be ready and watchful because he'll come back like a thief. And people are not going to be ready. Joshua set the tone for his house. Dad, that's what we got to do. We got to set the tone for our household. And we've got to teach our children that, uh, that their desires are not always going to be met until we let God show us what to desire, right? Uh, the, the younger, when we're young, you know, we want to have a job that makes lots of money. I, I taught a class in the seventh grade, and we, it was the career skills. And every job we talked about, the first thing the kids would say is, how much money do they make? How much money do they make? It will not make us happy. It will not make us happy. Uh, money is, is such a... Uh, a tricky thing. you got to have it to live. But you can't live your life around it. Amen. You can't live your life around it. So Joshua set the, uh, the tone for his house. He made a choice that must be made. You can't just decide not to make it. You can decide, well, I'm just not going to make a choice about God. You can't do it. 
If you say that, you, you've chosen no. So if we don't choose God, then what are we choosing? Who are we serving? The direction of a nation will begin with the family. Whenever God set up the institution of marriage in the Garden of Eden, He set it up for a reason that way. That's why it's a man and a woman. That, that's why it's what we follow because it's the best, the most perfect way that we can have a marriage is with a man and a woman that love each other and serve God. Amen. Amen? And I heard that they were, uh, somebody said in our prayer uh, this morning that in Canada they were making it illegal to preach against homosexuality or to say anything from the pulpit that would be negative about somebody that lives a homosexual lifestyle. Now, I'll never stand up here and say how bad people are. I'll never berate somebody, or, but we will pray for them, right? And we will stand on what's true. We'll have to stand on what the Word of God said, because if we're not, then who's going to make it up? If we're not going to do what the Word said about marriage, then who are we going to listen to? That's a hard thing. And I, there's probably a family in here that has uh, been through some things with that. I know at just about every church I've ever been at, there's been uh, a, a person that was dealing with the homosexual lifestyle. Uh, can't hate them. Can't stand at the door and keep them out. This is where they need to be. we got to go out and reach out to people, sometimes that are different than us, sometimes that look different. You know, it, it's a, where's that little girl? That's a little girl that was wearing a sparkly dress this morning. She must be church. But how can't you love her? You just got to. You know what I'm saying? But when it's an old man and they stink and they're a different color and uh, they live in a different place, that's the ones we got to be able to love. It's easy to love them little girls. It's easy to love these kids in here. It's just, sometimes it's easy to love them. Four famous fathers from the from the Bible. Noah, he lived different than the people around him. Abraham instructed his family in the ways of the Lord. Job prayed for his family that their hearts might stay pure. And Joshua, he chose the Lord for his home. I want to ask you, maybe there's somebody today that says we need to choose the Lord for our home. I need to say today that, 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 that we're going to make a difference, that we're going to invest in our children, that we're going to do these things but we're going to follow the example of godly men that were able to change the world. Somebody may be here today and you've never been saved. You don't know Jesus. If you died right now, you, you know you would not go to heaven. And you say, well, how do I know if I'm saved? If you don't know, then you probably are not. If you do not know, what did I say last time? I woke up this morning and knew I was fat and bald as soon as I looked in the mirror. There wasn't no doubt because that's what I am. Our preaching life should be the same way. People should be able to look at us and say they're different. Not fat and bone. <laughs> if you don't know Jesus, today is your day. Today is your day. He's calling your name. You were probably under conviction when we were singing the songs because the Holy Spirit has moved in here today. Yeah. Don't turn it down. I'm going to ask for a song leader to come up and give a, a hymn of invitation. And the invitation today is is your family where you need it to be? Is your family where you need it to be? Are there people we need to pray for? Is there people that we need to be talking to about Jesus? Is there something we do different in our home that would make it be a Christian home? Practical changes like read the Bible, pray together, do ministry together, things like that. And I promise it will make a difference in your kids too. But it's also, out of all the jobs I've ever had, I've been a youth pastor, a pastor, a missionary, a teacher, daddy is the most important job I ever had. And you know what? They're gone now. I, all the time that I've been able to put into them is used up. And now they'll raise their own families. And I want to be able to, to, to sit back and look at my family and say, you know, we have a legacy of Christians in our, in our family where we are producing young men that will change the world, young women that are pure and uh and, and, and work on holiness. Whatever the things that we say are important enough, what Sydney was looking like, wake her up every morning, I'd say, well, wake up, prettiest girl in the world. And then I'd grab her by the foot and drag her to me. <laughs> what I should have been saying was, the holiest girl that I know. 
instead of just looking at the, the, the beauty of our children or the, the grade in baseball, let's start instilling things about holiness and goodness and, and giving of themselves that the church may grow and that people may be saved. Stand as we sing. Let God speak to you.